Katie. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And as Katie mentioned, we are going to be covering accounts table. Um, hopefully, you guys will come away with some tips and tricks to think uh, to help manage your tables more efficiently. Uh, we're going to start out with a PowerPoint presentation, and we will toggle between this and the product. And as Katie mentioned, we'll have questions at the very end. So let's just go ahead and get started. We're going to cover AP accounts, which I find these to be a very underutilized, uh, very handy feature um, for clients to use, even if you're not on an accrual basis. We're going to cover vendors, vendor groups, payment vouchers, recurring transactions, a little bit about checks, quick checks, and voiding checks, and then how to use vendor inquiry to get information you may need. Let's talk about AP accounts. Within Juris Core, there is an area where you can create an AP account. Most of our clients are a cash basis for accounts payable, so typically you only have one. If you're on a cash basis, this GL account that's assigned to the AP account is never used, but Juris does require you to put one in there. Even if you are on a cash basis for AP, you can still create multiple AP accounts, and then you can use this setting or field to categorize, sort, on report, as well as when you go into your uh, selection. So under tables in Jurist, you're going to have an AP account. And as you can see from my PowerPoint that I've created several different AP accounts. Well, how is this going to benefit me? Let's say that when I do a check run, I only want to pull payables for farm operating expenses. I don't want to pull in everything. I don't want to pull an AP report and then pick and choose which voucher I want to pay right now. I just want to pull everything that I've entered into Jurist on the payment voucher as a, a farm payable, rent, utilities, etc. So I've created just an accounts payable firm AP account. I also have one for employee reimbursement. My attorney's pulling expense reports for out-of-pocket expenses that they paid up front. I want to pay them on a certain day. Well, I have so many employees, I don't want to have to go through and cherry pick which one. So I'm just going to create an AP group just for them. Also, client cost advances. Typically, we get a check request and we have a client cost, uh, you know, court reporters, um, filing fees, things like that, we typically have to run on a daily basis because you know the attorneys need those immediately, typically, but sometimes we have client cost advances that we may put into the system and pay at a later date. So we could create a, an account payable account for that. If you have multiple offices um, and you only want to pay the payables for that office, you can set an AP account for that. Now I'm going to toggle over to Juris to show you how to navigate to that in the system. So again, under tables, and then AP accounts. Again, if you're on a cash basis and you've been on Juris for years and years, you may only have one that's just called the accounts payable. Okay. So of course, to create one, we're just going to click on the new page icon. You give it a code, a description, and you're going to give it a GL account. Remember, if you're on a cash basis, you have to pick one, but it doesn't get utilized. If you're on an accrual basis, then of course when you post the voucher, it will hit and it will show on your balance sheet. You can use the same GL account. So if I don't want to have ways to create multiple GL accounts just to put in here, you can all use, like I've used my client cost advance, $2,500. This one is $2,000. Employee reimbursement. 2502. So again, you can use the same one or you can use different ones if you want to. Okay. Now let's talk back over to the presentation. And again, this is simply just a different uh, screenshot showing you that you can use the same GL account just what I showed you in Juris. So let's talk over to the next page now. How is this going to benefit me? There is a report, a canned report in Jurist Suite Reporting. It's a new one that's been added in, I believe, the last version. Uh, so if you're upgraded on the last version of Jurist Suite, there's a report, and it starts out with AP Dash. So if, again, if you have Jurist Suite, go in, find the reports that start with AP Dash, and it's the aged open item, aged open invoices with the as update now. The reason I like this report is because it shows you the AP account that you've assigned to that vendor. 
Okay, so you can run your payable. So now, actually, when you get ready to run this report, you can pick which payable group you want to look at. So let's say I want to see everything that I have outstanding for all of my employee reimbursements. I want to make sure I have enough cash to an operating account to cover a specific expense. So you can run that report. And I'm going to toggle into Jura Suite AP AP Open Invoices as of. And I'm going to expand the width of this screen just a bit. And there's a field where you can actually key in the AP group. And I'm going to put in ENT for my employee reimbursements. And I can say, oh, okay, Joe Brown, Joe Mathis, Star Jones, this is what I owe them. Over to the right-hand side, of course. So you can, again, run it. If I want to put in Maine, you can change it. And again, this is a canned report in Jura Suite reporting. If you don't have the Jura Suite reporting and you have custom access reports, you can have this one created for you as well. So, you know, this is not solely just for people that have Jura Suite reporting. You can still have this type of report created for you if you don't have that, but you're using any Microsoft Access reports. Okay, so let's close out of here. Let's toggle back over to our presentation. Okay, now let's move on to the actual vendor setup. These are just a few little tips and tricks. Setting up a vendor is pretty basic. You put in your vendor code, your vendor name, and you put a check mark whether it's active or not. Now, here are a couple little tips and tricks. If you have a vendor that you're not going to utilize anymore and you want to not be able to pick it on a payment voucher, you can deactivate the vendor. Now, when you do that, it also keeps you from looking at that vendor history in vendor inquiry. You may not want to completely get rid of it at that point. Maybe you it's a, you know freshly deactivated, and you still want to be able to go in and look at the history because you put client tables on it. You want to go look at history. So until you're completely through with it, use the no purchases option on the vendor. So if you can see the pointer on the mouse here with the no purchases, this actually will keep a, the AP person from selecting it on an AP voucher, but you can still look it up in vendor inquiry. Okay. Now let's move along to the hold all payments section. This will allow you um, allow, it allow, allows the entry of a new voucher, but it just doesn't let you select it in check line. So let's say that you're having a discrepancy with a vendor, you're still getting invoices, you can keep track of them, but you don't want to pay any yet because you may have gotten a duplicate and you need to get things sorted out. So you're like, okay, I'm going to let them be entered. I'm going to keep track of what I'm getting, but I don't want to pay any just yet. You can put a check mark in the hold all payments. Then, of course, we have our separate checks. You have invoices from certain vendors, let's say a court reporter. You want to pay that court reporter a separate check for every invoice you get. So on the vendor, go ahead and put a check mark in the separate check field. You can override this setting, though, when you're doing the payment voucher itself. So again, you're making a payment voucher out to a court reporter. It puts in a separate check. But let's say for one reason or another, you want to pay two vouchers. You get two uh, invoices from this court reporter for you know maybe two separate court dates. You can override that on the payment voucher. Now, let's get down to the area that I have highlighted in yellow. This is the payment group. This can be used similarly to an AP account. When you're selecting checks, you can select by payment group. You can also have a report to group by this. Now, payment groups are entered on the vendor itself. So let's use the employee reimbursements, for example. You can go into every single one of your vendors that you have set up for your attorneys, where you're cutting a check to them for employee reimbursements for expense reports. In the payment group field, this is an open field. You can put in up to three characters, so you create whatever you want. On that, I like to use EMP for employee. Okay, you know, you come up with whatever acronym you want, but it is again three field, three characters that you can put in there. So you actually apply this on the vendor itself. Now, the only benefit of doing that is when you're doing the payment voucher itself, if you're doing a payment group, what you're seeing here, instead of specifying an AP account, it automatically defaults on the voucher. You don't have to remember to put it on there. Okay? So again, they're used similarly. You can also use them in conjunction with each other. Um, if you have that complex of a <laughs> of a of, uh, 
AP that you have to pay. I found that most law firms typically don't have that um, complex AP system. Um, you know, again, most a lot of people, I will say this, they won't even put their payment vouchers in the system. They just keep them on their desk or files. And they know when things need to get paid. Um, you know, we, we, we try to stray away from that because if you're ever asked, what is, what is your open item balance? Well, you don't know. The only person in the firm that knows is the person that is holding all of the vouchers. And then he or she has to go and calculate, okay, well, let me look and see. Let me run a tally. You know, if the partner asks you, okay, what are our payables? If you don't have them in the system, there's no way to run a report on that. So, again, payment groups are set up on the vendor itself. And let's move along to vendors. Also on the vendor, you can set up defaults. Of course, let's say you have a vendor, clerk of court. This is always going to be E112 court fees or whatever other in-house code that you may use if you're not using the, um, the standard ADA code. Default AP account. When we pay the clerk of court, we're always billing a client. Therefore, I'm going to default this to my CCA client cost advance default um, AP account. So when I'm creating a vendor, a voucher, I don't have to remember, oh, what is this? Of course, you have your default GL account, and then your discount account. This field is required within Juris, as you probably well know. Um, if you don't give a discount, then it will never be utilized, but Juris does require you to put something in that field so you, again, could put in your distribution account, or if you have some sort of default uh, discount account, which if you've converted from Juris uh, to Juris in the last couple of years, we've gotten in the habit of just putting in the default discount account. Okay, let's move along. Um, when you're in an actual payment voucher under the tools area, you have a continuous new mode. So when you go on to create a list of payment vouchers, every time you hit save, of course, you're going to get a new voucher. You don't have to continue to hit the new page icon. You can also set it to duplicate the voucher date, the vendor code. You can tell it to skip the purchase order number, which hardly anyone ever uses. You can also put a check mark in the continuous new on expense details. What does that do? Well, when you, after you put in the first expense entry and you hit save, it's going to give you a new pop-up box. This may be beneficial when you're doing a, um, an expense voucher, like for FedEx. You have multiple different client expenses, so you just want to continue to provide a new form for you. Now, the one at the bottom, distribute full amount on expense entries. This is kind of a, um, I have a lot of clients that are using this when they, they don't want to forget to expense it to a client. Let's say a FedEx, for example. When you get that, you know that part of that bill is going to be client expenses and you know, a large portion of it will be firm expenses. But if you put a check mark and distribute full amount on expense entries, every time you create a new expense, it's going to put the full remaining amount on that expense entry. Yes, you will have to go in there and change it to what you want to bill that particular client, but it's continuing to put a new one and putting an amount in there so it makes you stop and think, okay, Yes, I, I do need to put this in because it's going to force me. Uh, you know, once you post a payment voucher and you've forgotten to expense it out to a client, what are your options? Well, either you're going to void the voucher and redo it with the expense distribution or go in and put the expense entry in by itself. Not the end of the world, but those two items are no longer, are, they're no longer tied, so you can't track that as far as reporting goes. Uh, you know, which client did I bill for this, et cetera. So distribute full amount basically forces you to stop and think and put in the accurate amount. And on the payment voucher itself, of course, you can add a new vendor. This is a little icon that I have highlighted in yellow here. Under Tools, you also have an Add Vendor option. And you can also edit an existing vendor. You may not know that. So when you actually key in the vendor code, then there is an Edit Vendor icon. So again, you have to pick the vendor. Then you have an edit vendor, change of address, change of the, um, the vendor name. Maybe you want to change the vendor code, change the default GL distribution. When you're in the voucher, you don't want to have to stop, get out of your voucher batch, go under table vendor, find the vendor, and change it. So here, again, you can change it on the fly when you put in the vendor code. Just a warning. 
Be sure and don't type over an existing vendor and rename it to a completely new vendor because then your vendor history for your old vendor is still there on that vendor, even though you've given it a new code or a new name. So just be careful about that. Be careful on that as well if you're changing vendors simply under table vendors. Very, very, very often I have found, even from back in the old support days, um, clients would say, oh, well, this vendor, all of the vendor history for FedEx is now showing up under my Clark of Court. Well, you may have accidentally opened up a vendor and typed over it instead of creating a brand new one. So just be careful with that. And then, of course, you can add a temp vendor on the fly. Now, I'm not a big fan of temp vendors, personally. Um, it's just a little more difficult to track the information that you've written. You have to go in under the temp vendor and look up the history. Now that vendors have the option to deactivate a vendor, I'm just a big fan of just putting in everything in as a regular vendor. Easy to look at the history on it. You don't have to go into the master temp vendor history and hunt and find to see what you've done. And at the end of the year, you can go in and deactivate vendors. If you have a large amount of vendors that you need to deactivate based on a specific criteria, uh, the professional services can create utilities for you. If you want to do a mass cleanup, and it's uh, pretty common factors. You know, I don't want, I want to deactivate everything that hasn't been used in so many months or so many days or specific calendar year. So, you know, again, think about that, guys. If you have a large amount of vendors, you want to do a cleanup, Jurist Professional Services can have a utility for you on that. Move on to the next one. Again, within a payment voucher, you can drill down and put in the GL distribution. So if the vendor itself does not have a default GL distribution, you have to drill down and you have to specify which one. Let's take a look, look at the one we have here. We would use this one um, for a firm, uh, a vendor like FedEx. We have half of the client, I'm too far. We have a client cost advance, and then we have a part of it we want to put to firm delivery expense. The icon at the top here that I've highlighted in yellow, which is the dollar sign with zero, if you left click on that, it's going to allocate or put the rest, the remaining amount of that DL voucher in that field. So you don't have to you know, calculate what's left. This will just put it in there for you. So again, you can put in multiple GL accounts as long as you distribute the full amount of the payment voucher. And then on the expense distribution to the client itself, if you if it's FedEx, for example, this goes back to the setting about distributing the full amount on the expense distribution. You want to make sure that you don't forget and bill charge it to client for every expense that's on there. If you put in a dollar amount that is more than a voucher, you're going to get the message that you see below. It's going to let you know that you put in an amount that exceeds what your voucher is. Basically, hey, you're about to bill your client more than what you're paying. It's going to give you a message. It'll let you do it. Just going to give you a warning. Now, if you have the setting on the vendor or the voucher to dis distribute the full amount, um, you're not going to forget to bill the client for everything that's out there because it's going to continue putting in a dollar amount that you're going to have to edit until you're through. Now, this is another report that is in the Juris Suite Standard Report. It's the AP AP Open Invoices with Matter Expense Distribution. And again, if you don't have Juris Suite reporting, you can still have a report like this created in Access. Now, let's, let's go back one. Now, okay, here we go. But this report within Juris Suite is going to show you all of your open invoices, unpaid vouchers. Okay. There's also going to be an optional in there. Well, do you only want to show vouchers that have expense distributions to client? You can say yes or no. On this one, I said no, so I'm seeing all of my unpaid vouchers. It's going to show me the voucher information in the right-hand side of the report shows which client and matter, the amount, the, in, the expense code, the expense narrative. That's what everything is sold on that client. We have an expense distribution amount. We'll take a look at this first one, $50 to FedEx. Expense payment allocation, zero. None's been paid. Basically, the client hasn't paid for it. The next column is the expense distribution balance, $50. So let's me know that they haven't paid anything. So um, very often we're finding with um, IT firms especially, you may have foreign associates that 
are basically they're your client as well as a vendor, and there are large invoices, thousands of dollars, where you may not want to pay that vendor until your client has paid you. So this is a way that you can keep track of that. Um, you can run it for that vendor, and you can see, okay, the balance on the far right-hand side is unpaid. So therefore, I am not going to pay this voucher until that is zero. So let me toggle over to Juris Suite, and you can take a look at that report. AP-AP open invoices with matter expense distributions. So double click on this, and then I'm going to widen the screen just a bit. Only show invoices with matter expense distributions. Yes or no? Okay, so I selected no. It's going to show me everything that's out there. Let's move this out of the way here. And on the right hand side again, it's going to show you your balance. So if you're wanting to utilize this report, as I mentioned earlier, as a tool to allow the firm to select which vouchers they want to pay based on if they're, your client has paid you, this will show it. If you only want to show vouchers with expense distributions, put yes. Now, I also like this. After you put in AP, all of your invoices, and you can go back and run your, you know, your payment voucher edit list before you post your voucher, or you can run that AP payment voucher audit list to check and make sure that you've expensed it out to the client. But this is a good double check to let you say, okay, this vendor, whoa, wait a minute, this should have been a client expense. Why don't I have a payable over here to the right? You know, just another way for you to check to make sure that you've built everything to the client. So again, yes or no. You can run this report, let you check and see. Now, if this is something that you don't want to manually check every day, if, you know, again, if this applies to you and this is a, a problem where you're constantly having to maintain, has a client paid me, can I pay the, the, the vendor yet? You can also have an alert set up if it's that important that you are alerted as you know, the, the quickest amount of time instead of having to run this report on, the, on a daily basis. You can have an alert set up in business intelligence where it alerts you when a client has paid and you have an open payable. Okay? Uh, again, just depends on how much time you have on your hands to manage this. Let's toggle back over to our presentation. Now let's go on to recurring transactions. If you have payables, if you have the same thing every month, you can create a recurring transaction within Juris. That recurring transaction, let's say it's a rent or a utility. Maybe it's not the same dollar amount every month, but it's the same one. Or maybe even it's a quarterly payment. You can set up a recurring transaction within Juris. Of course, then you schedule it to give you a notification of when you want to pay that voucher. When you get that notification, you can go into the voucher and you can change anything on it. So this is one of the, the benefits is you can set up that recurring transaction with as much or as little information as you want to, and then when you get notified to make that payment, you basically open up that payment voucher and then change the information or provide it. So again, let's say that it's a different dollar amount every month, utilities, or, uh, you know, electric, etc. cetera. Uh, you want to put in the vendor name, you could put in the GL account that it goes to, everything except the dollar amount, and then you can, again, override it and put in the current month's reference, the GL uh, memo that you want to put in each month. If you don't want to set this up as a reminder, but you just want to use this as a template every month, let's say rent, um, or, you know, 401k distribution payment amount, you can go in, and we toggle into Juris for this one. When you're in a payment voucher itself, let's create a new payment voucher batch. So you're about to create the payment voucher. You can go into Form and create it from a template. So again, I wasn't setting it up to give me a notification. I just know that I have a template out there that has all my info in it already, but I want to have to create, start from scratch, so let's say rent. So it's going to pull in that amount. You can just change. See, the reference isn't in here, so I'm going to put in July rent. I can type here. And then, of course, if you don't have a discount account or a, uh, a digital distribution account, you can override it at the time. So we'll save that. Of course, I have to 
put in the invoice number. Let's save that. Right. Well, I don't know why I came up with that invoice date. Let's look in here back. Okay, we're just gonna we're just gonna forget this one. It's giving it's giving me great on, on my dates here. So once this is created, post it and the next month again. Your template is out there under transactions recurring transactions, and then we have a voucher template. So you can create the template itself from drilling down to this area, clicking on the new page icon, you know, just simply give it a code, you can give it a comment, we'll just, we'll just call this rent, okay? Then the notification list is who gets the notification. Who in the firm do you want to get the pop-up when they log into Jura Suite? It's going to automatically default to the person that's creating it, but let's say you want someone else, so your, your assistant or someone else in the accounting department to also get this in case you're out. You can drill down and you can select another person to get the notification. Um, you're going to put in the vendor, Dr. Smith Buckland, our landlord for rent, Default distribution account is pulling from the vendor already. The AP account, I'm just going to leave that one as accounts payable firm. And again, you can set up, put in the invoice amount or not. You can give it a reference already, monthly rent. And then, of course, again, when you go into payment vouchers, new, new, form, create from templates. And it's going to pull in everything that I previously put in. This one I didn't put in an amount because maybe my rent changes every month. The sliding scale. Okay. Now, if you look down at the bottom where I have the flashing, this is how you're going to get the notification. So if you had it set up as a notification, when you log into Juris that morning, you're going to get a pop-up and it's going to tell you, oh, you have monthly recurring bills. You need to go in and post. Oh, okay. Well, I have my rent, or on my Frisco building, and my water bill. These were set up. These were scheduled to let you know to pay these. Okay. Well, you're like, well, I just walked in this morning. I don't have time to deal with this right now. I just want to defer it. You can defer it for a specific number of days or to a specific date. Now, that means you're not going to get a pop-up reminding you of this particular item, okay? Now, if you just click out of here and close out and you don't hit defer, it's going to stay down here. So let's say you have to get some emails out, do payroll, but you want to come back to it. Just left-click on the clock icon at the bottom center, and it's going to pop those back up for you. You're like, okay, I'm ready to deal with this voucher situation. Left-click on the rent. Reminder, and it's going to pull up that payment voucher, and then you're going to go in and put in whatever information you want. And then when you save this, this is going to be an unposted payment voucher batch, so you will have to go in and post this. So once it's posted, it's out there in your payable. So you can go into a regular check line and pay it, or you can go into the quick check and just select that one payment voucher. Right, so let's get back to our presentation. This is the screen that it would look like to show you how you can schedule it. You can schedule it weekly, monthly, by period, again, if it's a quarterly insurance payment, or specific user defined. This is going to let you put in the exact date. So again, like insurance, you have specific premium dates. Maybe it's not, you know, now, the 15th of every month, but it's specific dates. You can actually put that in. I'll show you what that looks like within Juris Core. So let's go in under Transactions, Recurring Transactions, and Schedule. So this is our monthly recurring bill. So when we go into the Change button, so User Defined, you can actually put in the specific date. And you can put in as many as you want to. Okay. You can have um, the duration of the current accounting year, or you can have an end date. Now, if I if you don't have the accounting year created within Juris, like 2016, it's not created yet. I haven't had a reason to. But if it's created, you can expand this out as far as the accounting years that you have set up in Juris. And again, that's under Set Up and Manage. 
counting period. You say I only have 2015, so I can't even put it down to 2016 because the system doesn't realize that it exists. Just click on the new page icon to create the next accounting year and hit save. Don't do this if you're not ready. Um, if you don't have any rules set up or user ID permissions where people can't put anything into, um, or time entries especially, into an, uh, a past or future accounting period because you don't want people accidentally putting time entries into 2016, of course. Let's get back in here. So again, why use schedules? Well, you never forget a critical transaction. You have on-time payments. If you have regularly scheduled draws or ACH payments that come out, you, um, you can set it up to give yourself a schedule notification of that so you can put it, a quick check in your system for that draft. Now, let's talk about selecting and printing checks. How will we use our vendor groups and our AT payments? So, of course, when you select checks, you have to pick the bank account. Now, the next field is the AP account. So, in that field, you have to specify which AP account I want to pull checks from. Well, if you want to select all, then you just simply tab past that field and it defaults to all. Or if you just want your employee expense distributions, then you would select that from the dropdown. So, let me toggle into Jura on that one. So, in transactions, we're going to click on checks. New page icon, of course. Bank account, pick our operating. AP account, so if you were to tab past that, it's going to select all. But let's say, no, I want to actually go in and I just want my employee reimbursement. We're going to tab past vendor group. Of course, you're going to put in your payment date. Let's update this. I'm not saying I want to pay checks again in a week. Okay. So that is our AP account. Now, let's talk about our vendor group. We have an employee vendor group, and we have an FAW vendor group. It's only going to be listed here if there are unpaid vouchers that exist. If you have vendors that are, that are created out there that are multiple different groups, they're not going to be listed in here unless there's an unpaid voucher. Okay? So we're just going to pick AT group employee Reimbursements, we're going to tab past vendor group because we don't need it for this particular one. And of course, we're going to pick past due, current, and I like to just pick if you'll, you'll lose a discount. Most people don't use that, but I just like to check it anyway. And of course, then you're going to hit select. And I don't have any out here right now on this, on this particular date range, so I didn't pull any in. So let's talk back to our presentation for this. Okay? So if you can look at the, at the screenshot that I have here that I have pulled in vouchers, it's going to give us the check number. Now, I haven't actually printed the check yet, so it doesn't know which check number it is. But I like to use this as a tool on the check number field to let you see how many checks I actually need to get out of the filing cabinet to put into the printer. Um, I'm going to print two checks. My vendor high design is going to print two vouchers on one check, so it lets me see, okay, well, we need to get two checks out. Also, if you scroll over to the payment column, you can actually edit this on the fly, okay? So let's say this $2,000 payment that I have to read in Clark, say, you know, I've set up a payment plan with them. I'm going to pay this $1,000 over three months. I didn't put in three separate vouchers for 1000 I put in one. You can click your mouse in the payment column and overwrite that and just pay a portion. If you do that, then of course the unpaid portion is going to stay out there as an unpaid payment voucher. So when you do your next check run, whatever the balance is, is going to pull in. Next month, let's say we pay, you know, we'll just say it's too easy. Two, two monthly payments of $1,000. I'm going to put in a payment amount of 1000 post this check. Next month, I'm going to do a check run, and then my remaining portion of 1000 is going to pull in as well. So a lot of people I've noticed that they don't know that. Most law firms don't usually make a lot of partial payments on things, but if you have a large expense and you have an arrangement set up, you can do that instead of putting in multiple small vouchers. Okay? Now, when you're in here, if you pull in a payment voucher that you don't want to pay, of course, you can highlight the voucher and then go to Form or Edit Remove Voucher. So let's actually pop into Juris on this one, okay? Make sure I don't have any unposted payment vouchers here. I'm 
I'm actually going to put in every, everything. I'm not going to limit this at all, so we make sure that we pull in some. And I'm going to say I'm not going to write checks again for a month. Okay, so here we have three different vouchers, and we have one that's actually a temp vendor. So vendor, temp, my Sally Sue Southern style catering in here that I'm not going to use anymore. Other catering business was, or vendor was booked, I couldn't, so we used this temp one I'm not going to use anymore. So I did set it up as a temp vendor. So again, if you want to remove the voucher, edit, remove voucher, that doesn't void the voucher, obviously, that just says I don't want to pay it this month. Now, if you were to actually go to form and print checks, it's going to assign a check number here. Now, if you wanted to void a voucher within here, void selection, it's grayed out now. I don't want to actually print all of these checks, but once you've printed a check, let's say the first check prints on regular paper or it got crumbled up in the, in the printer, you can actually void the check from within the check batch. Highlight, Tools, Void Selection. That check will show up as a voided check in your checkbook. So you can again keep track, you know, check number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 was destroyed, void it within here. And then of course you can post the rest of the checks. Actually you have to post it first and then you can void it. No, I took that back. If you print it, then you can void it before, and then you can post the two other checks. Sorry, I had to think about that one. Okay, so let's go back to our presentation here. Also, in quick checks, you can also add, edit a vendor, or select a temp vendor. Okay, so again, when you're in a quick check, you can select an existing vendor, of course, you can edit the vendor with your same option. Once you select that vendor, you can go to the edit vendor. You can create a new voucher, or you can pay an existing voucher. Okay, a lot of people don't know that, so when you're in Juris, quick check. You have a payment voucher that, you're, that you've created. And let's say... I have one for Joe Brown out there. Okay, so I've picked Joe Brown. So instead of clicking on the new page icon, I am going to go into tool select voucher. And I am going to search. Okay, he's the mother check that I have to, I have to take him out. Hold him on my check run. So now I'm not going to be able to pick him in here because he's already hanging out in this check run. Actually, he's not. I did have one for FedEx. So again, quick check. Let's do this one again, guys. Sorry. So bank account, operating, vendor. I know we have one for FedEx. And then tools, select voucher. And then you can double click and you can pay an existing payment voucher. Now, of course, the payment voucher is already posted, so you can't edit the payment voucher like you can on the fly when you're creating a brand new one. You would have to void it and redo it just like you would normally. Okay, let's get back over here to the presentation. And then, of course, voiding checks. If you printed and posted a check and you need to void it, then you will go in and you'll void the check. Um, the Date option, you have to be very careful about that and how your firm wants to handle the date range on which you void a check. Um, if you do not have permission, the user ID within Juris, if you don't have permission to void an original date, the user is not going to get the date option. It's going to automatically default to today's date. Okay? So again, just depends on your firm's policy on, you know, do you want to void checks in the original date? I mean, that's going to debit the cash account on the original date of the check, or do you want to void it in today's date? So again, 
if, if the person that's assigned the, the permissions to void check, if they're not seeing the original date option, it's because they don't have permission to do that, and everything is automatically defaulting to today's date. When you void a check, obviously you have the option to void the voucher. If the voucher has an expense distribution to a client, well, what do you want to do with that? You have an option to avoid that expense distribution. So you have to stop and think, well, wait a minute, has that expense distribution been billed? If it has been billed, then if you tell it you want to avoid the distribution, it's going to create a negative expense entry. Well, what's going to happen to that negative expense entry? Well, it's going to show up on the client's next invoice. There may be other expenses out there with it that may be the only expense there may be. That may be it. The file may have been completely closed and you're just not avoiding this check and now you have to refund the client a refund check for that expense. So again, when you're avoiding vouchers and their client distributions, you have to kind of stop and do a little bit of research and think, well, what do I want to do with this expense entry? Uh, you know, again, do I want to net it against upcoming fees and expenses or is the file open and I just need to cut the client a check for the refund? So a little bit of legwork is involved in that. Now, vendor inquiry. When you're in vendor inquiry, of course, you can go in and you can view paid vouchers, unpaid vouchers. You can right click and drill down. I'm actually going to go into Juris on this one. Okay, so under inquiry, vendor inquiry, I'm going to go in here and let's do under the summary tab, of course, it's going to give you the net activity, but under vouchers, the default view is to view unpaid vouchers. Okay, well, I want to see all vouchers, or I want to see paid vouchers. Just change your view. I haven't paid anything to this vendor. If you right-click on it, it's going to drill down. It's going to show you the actual payment voucher that was created at the time. Double-click in the GL distribution to review that. You can double-click in the expense distribution to see if you billed it to a client. Okay, look, this is an unpaid voucher. This is where that original report will come in handy. You don't have to go back and drill down to every single vendor to remind yourself, oh gee, did I bill that to the client or not? If it's unpaid, run this report and it's going to show you your expense distribution instead of having to, again, go back into Juris Core hunting for it. Okay? Again, right click, drill down, look at the information on here. Now, let's look at our temp vendors. Again, don't really love temp vendors because it seems you know, it's more difficult to track down the, what you've done on them. But in the vendor code lookup, if you go into the show options, you can put a check mark in it, show temp vendors. Okay? Well, I have Master Temp and I have Sally Foods. Well, why do I have Sally Foods? I've written a lot of temp vendor checks throughout the year. Why don't I see everything else? It's only going to show you the temp vendor if there are unpaid vouchers. Everything that's been paid previously is now housed under Master Temp Vendor. So Sally Sue is the only one that I haven't paid yet. So we're going to go into Voucher, View, Unpaid. Here we go. Here's my $2,000 unpaid voucher. And it's going to hang out there under this vendor until it's paid. Once it's paid, I'm not going to see Sally Sue anymore. It's going to be only under Master Temp. So let's go into Master Temp and let's see, well, what have I paid to Master Temp? Okay, nothing is unpaid. I have one item that's been paid. Let's go over here to the checks tab. Who did I pay it to? Well, it was Joe's court reporting. If you use a temp vendor, the memo field on the checks tab is going to show you the name of your temp vendor. So again, you can go in here to temp vendor and see everyone that you've paid. If, in fact, you do want to go back and try to figure out, well, wait a minute, I think I paid that tent vendor over $600. They are 1099 criteria, so now I've got to go back and hunt and pay for it. So you do have the ability to, to find it by going into vendor code temp. Okay? I'll go back over here to our presentation. And let's take a look at our time here. Okay, that concludes it. This is just a... a the deck sheet on your uh, presentation that you're going to get from Katie um, has hyperlinks to the um, Juris Support and also to the Juris Professional Services website and our email, Juris Professional Solutions at LexisNexis.com. Uh, so if you have any questions about the presentation afterwards, you can email Juris Professional Solutions at LexisNexis.com. You can also email JPS.
that will get you there as well. So Katie, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions. All right, fabulous. Well, first off, thank you, Celeste, so much for your very informative session. This does conclude the presentation portion of our webinar. So as a reminder, if you do have questions, please feel free to ask them via the questions pane located in your webinar control panel. We already have a few. Uh, our first question is, please tell us more about the business intelligent alert regarding when an expense distribution has been paid. OK. I'm going to pop Juris Suite up on the screen. Within Juris Suite, there is a business intelligence portion. So this is a module within the Juris Suite uh, product. Okay, Business intelligence has a feature within there where alerts can be created. Okay, Bottom line, any event, any occurrence, any condition that takes place within Juris Core, if you need to be notified of it, you can have an alert set up. Typically, this is a little more complex, and you may need um, the reporting team to create the alert for you. So as an example, you say, this is my criteria. I need to be notified every single time a voucher, an unpaid voucher, has in the corresponding expense um, entry that gets paid. That's my condition. I want to be emailed, and I want to have a report emailed to me showing me, you know, who the vendor was, the expense distribution. You know, you define all the criteria, and then it sets it up. And then the frequency in which it runs, you can basically say, you know what, once a day is good enough for me. I don't need to be notified every hour on the hour, just once a day. So you can have the report writer set up the alert to say, OK, every morning at 6 a.m., I'm going to run this. And any voucher, again, that's um, outstanding, that the expense entry has been paid, so it would have had to have been paid the previous day because we're going to have it run every morning. It will send you an email or anyone on anyone that you say you want the email, wants to get the email, and you again can have it accompanied with a report. Um, some other alerts just to kind of let you guys brainstorm. Let's say that you have a client that you want to be notified when your trust balance is below a certain dollar amount, or their WIP balance is a certain percentage of their trust. Again, any condition within the software that you're having to constantly run reports to maintain, you can have an alert set up to pop you an email whenever you need to be notified. Again, you can set those up to run daily. Every hour on the hour, if it's something that critical that you need to be notified of. And again, the report writers are going to be creating them. So basically, anything that you can come up with, if, 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 if it can be measured within Juris, you can be notified of it. So any other questions on that, Katie, the person that had previously asked that? No, that was great. Um, our next question is maybe on the same line, along the same lines. When I set up a new recurring voucher template and add it to an existing schedule, I have an issue where several notifications pop up for that reference, going back to the beginning of the year. I have to click Cancel for each backdated reminder. Is there a way to avoid this? OK, so let me say, so I've opened up one. And you're saying that you would come in here and you would add a new one. And it's going back and oh, that sounds vaguely familiar. Um, I have to do some research on that. It seems like I have possibly seen that. So let's say you're going in and just adding a new one. And then it's when you save it, it's giving you an update for all of the ones that have previously been in there. Katie, if you will can get the person that made this ad, get their email address, and I will check on that. She said yes, <laughs> exactly, by the way. But yes, okay. we can follow up with her too offline. Sounds vaguely familiar. Um, let me. I'll do some research and see if there's if that's just the way it is, or if there's some some check mark setting that you can do on that. Um, and I will let you know on All that right, as well. Okay. Next question. All right. Our next question is. Um, when I run checks, it always gives me the notice quote, higher, and then the pound sign, out of order check number. How can I set my check number in Juris so that it knows the next 
correct check number. So when you're in checks, I believe that she's saying in the check column, so I'm going to say this. So when you go into a regular check line and not a, not a quick check, Katie? I believe so. Okay. So it's yeah, on a regular check. check. Okay. When you're in regular checks, uh, let me see if I can actually select them. I, I believe she's saying that this first column here, is this what she's referring to where it has the check number? Yes. The check number is too high. Okay, so it's, it's being noted three. as a it's out of order because it's higher than the correct check number. Gotcha. Okay, so this is a warning that's been built into Juris. Make sure I'm following this correctly, Katie. Let me know. She um, did say when she's but, trying to print the checks. Okay, this is a feature within Juris. It's basically letting you know that you're trying to print a check number where a higher one has been printed. Now, show check number warning. If you get this option, have her take a look at the screen and see if this is the message she gets. She was saying that's the screen she gets. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. If you uncheck this, then you should not get that anymore. Now, again, if you're writing, I mean, this happens frequently. Maybe you have two multiple people printing checks out of the same check stock. You know, if somebody goes down into the middle of the check to pull out a check, or you have a manual checkbook that you're writing in addition to your computer checks, they're out of check sequence, you're going to get this message. It's just a warning letting you know, hey, wait a minute, there's a check that's been written that's higher than this, so what's going on? Do we have some pilferage with the checks, or did you key it incorrectly? But again, if you uncheck this show check number warning, that should make that go away. If, in fact, you don't want to get notified of it. I mean, if you know that that's happening and you don't want to, uncheck it. All right, great. Okay. I'm going to pull these out. I'm going to pull these out uh, and reselect these. Oh, I've already printed the checks. It's not going to let me. Um, I'm just going to avoid one check and do another check run because I want to make sure that that, that notification goes away here. Yes, yes, we know. Okay, so I've selected this, form, print, checks. Okay, so that message went away. So have her uncheck that warning, and then she shouldn't get that message anymore. All right. Great. Thank you so much. If I have a follow-up question to that. Um, if somebody okay. processed a manual check with a higher number, would that create that warning? Absolutely. Because the system doesn't know. I mean, you can say that it was a manual check, but it doesn't know that it was actually handwritten check. You, yes, you said it was a manual check, but it could have been a computer check that you put in a typewriter for whatever reason and printed it. So whether you're running two sets, a manual handwritten checklist that maybe the partner has at his desk if he writes checks and then you're doing computer checks, if it's a check number in that bank, it's just going to give you that warning. Gotcha. All right, our next question is, Can checks be printed for the current day if the period has been moved from the previous month to do bank recs? If you've moved the accounting period, read that to me one more time, Katie. Sure. Can checks be printed for the current day if the, if the period has been moved to the previous month to do bank reconciliation. Okay, are you actually moving the accounting period back? To That's do what bank it's sounding like to me. Yes, she is saying yes. She is saying yes. Okay, you don't have to move the accounting period back to do a check rec for that period, first of all. So you don't have to do that. But even if you did do that, 
you can write a check. You should be able to write a check for any check date as long as you have permissions to write checks. I mean, in the user, I, I ask her to see if she responds. Are you getting a message that you can't do that? Give it a second here, because I'm guessing okay. she's typing a response. She's been on top of it. She said, another person wrote a check while the period was moved back. So it doesn't sound like that she's getting a response that she can't, but uh, maybe that caused an issue. It, it shouldn't. And again, you, okay. you do not have to move the accounting period back to go into a check reconciliation at all. I mean, no one gets their, their bank statement immediately. So when you go into bank account, you do not have to go in and change your accounting period back. Like right now, I haven't reconciled March, but my accounting period is July. I don't have to change my accounting period back to do this at all. So even if it did, look, my accounting, look, I haven't reconciled. I haven't done my March behind. I'm overwhelmed. I can't do my check rec yet. So right. I need to do my March <laughs> one. But I can, but I can go in and I can do a check and I can date it today, no problem. It's not going to give me any warning. So even if I did go in to accounting periods and do what you're doing and say to the March, which you don't have to, I can still do a check. It's not going to tell me that I can't date it today. So ask, see if she responds. If, is there giving her? Is there an issue? Is she having a problem, or she just didn't think that you should be able to do that? I'm not sure. Um, see, I'm seeing if anything else pops up. For one more right. second. Sure. I thought you needed to be in the same period as the statement to do reconciliation. No, so it sounds like there's not an issue. It's just something she wasn't sure about. Okay. Okay. And she can follow. If she has any questions, she can email the Juris Professional Solution or the GAPS at LexisNexis.com. But yeah, don't don't go back in and change your accounting period because then all the transactions that are taking place while you bounced it back are going into other folders, which again doesn't hurt anything. It just you know puts things in a different folder which might be slightly confusing, but again, you do not have to change your accounting period back to do your bank rate at all. All right, wonderful. Well, we are about out of time, um, but we will. I know there's a lot of questions we didn't get a chance to answer today. Um, Celeste, if you could put that last screen up once again. If you do have a question, please email it to JPS at LexisNexis.com, and we'll show that email address in a moment. I can't move to get my WebEx screen out of I'm just going to scroll to the last page here, guys, if I can get my mouse. Okay. Okay, Juris Professional Solutions at LexisNexis.com, or JPS at LexisNexis.com. All right, well, thank you so, so, so much. Celeste, and we You're hope you all um, email your questions to Juris Professional um, Solutions at LexisNexis.com. That concludes today's webinar. Uh, thank you all again for joining us today. I have a, a few quick follow-up remarks.